Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Fulmer. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm a longtime Nix, Nix OS user. Um, I gave a talk back in 2020 um, during the NixCon, the virtual NixCon during COVID, about uh, Robotnics, where I discussed some work on like building Android systems with Nix. But it's uh, it's exciting to be here in person and meet all these people that you know I've interacted with a bit in the community over time. But today I'm going to speak about a bit about um, automating testing of NixOS on actual physic real physical machines. Um, and as a bit of context to this, oh, excuse me. Aspect ratio is a little off, but um, if anyone is not familiar with the NixOS VM test framework, it's, in my opinion, one of the best things about NixOS. Um, especially, um, here's a simple, exa the simple example of what a NixOS VM test looks like. In the middle, you see there nodes.machine equals a little bit of Nix code. That snippet is you can put in NixOS configuration there. And when you start the NixOS test, it'll start up a QEMU VM that has that NixOS configuration in it. So you can like enable services, you can do net weird stuff with networking, you can um, do all the stuff you could normally do with a NixOS configuration, it'll start up a QEMU instance. And then you can also associate a test script with that, that test. And you can do various things like wait for services to start, execute arbitrary commands, and assert various things. The test script is just Python script. But in my opinion, uh, the NixOS test uh, framework is one of the reasons why Nix is able to move so quickly and be so reliable over time. You know, when we do, when we do big changes to core libraries, we can just run all the tests and see what broke. Um, one of my favorite examples of the NixOS test is the BitTorrent test. This is a pretty involved test where it spins up, you know, four different NixOS VMs on a virtual network, um, a tracker slash seeder. Um, a router and then two client machines, and they have this in the t how the way the test script works is one machine seeds the torrent, and then you have a cl another client that downloads it, um, and it goes over this virtual network that is routed by the router machine, um, includes NAT as well, just to make it a little more tricky, I guess, and then they do the thing where they turn off the original seeder, and then the second client downloads the content from the first client. Um, so this this test is implicitly testing like a whole bunch of functionality like um, Linux routing, the networking stuff we have in Nix packages, in, in NixOS modules, NAT traversal, the tracker, client, all that stuff. A little bit briefly about how do these NixOS tests, VM tests, actually work under the hood. Like I said, they start up QEMU um, virtual machines, and that virtual machine boots directly into the kernel in NITRD that's built as part of the NixOS closure. Um, what makes this particularly faster than what you might imagine an alternative system would be is they just, in the guest VM, they mount the slash nix slash store directories mounted from the host, effectively. So what you can do is we don't need to like create a full system image. If, if you imagine like a traditional um, distribution or something where you might have to like, if you want to run a test like this, you might have to make a full on like, I don't know, five, 10 gigabyte image, disk image, and then boot into that. Here we can just bind mount the host disk store. It has all the contents we need and just run directly from there. And then the test driver, the Python test driver, um, interacts with the QEMU um, VM on a bunch of different interfaces, looks at the serial port, um, can run commands via this backdoor console. Like I said, the benefit is it's relatively fast. I mean, relative to, you have to specify what you're relative to, but, um, fast enough for many purposes, and stateless, right? You can just throw away all of the state if you just don't save the disk image around. So I would love to have something like that for physical devices. Um, there is, like, there's a limit to how much you can do with just VMs. And at some point, you need to test. There are certain things that you need the physical hardware to test on. So if you have unique peripherals or cards or something, you just actually have to run it on the real machine. Um, additionally, like performance testing, um, if you want to have representative um, testing of performance of various programs, you probably want to run it on the machine you actually um, need to have guarantees for performance about. Um, as well, it'd be nice to have, you know, uh, be able to do regression testing and check if anything's breaking. Um, and then having some automation around this dramatically reduces the testing workload. So, like at my work, you could imagine I'd have a whole bunch of physical devices on my desk, and then I have to, like, plug in all sorts of different peripherals to run the test. It's a very, very manual process, and you want something to put that in a, in a system where you can automate a lot of that stuff, and not have to do it so manually every single time. 
Um, and then I say I think it's especially valuable for like the embedded slash ARM ecosystem, where compared to the x86 world, every, devices are all kind of like special snowflakes. Depending which venue you get it from, you may have to run a special kernel for that particular device, or need to load up some drivers for that device. Um, just, just running it on an x86 machine is very different than what you might want to run on a real ARM machine. And so the example use case I'm going to discuss in this talk um, are these things called NVIDIA Jets devices. So NVIDIA makes these um, ARM-based computers um, that are intended for use in sort of like embedded edge IoT type applications. Um, it includes NVIDIA's GPU technology. So you, um, you can run like AI machine learning type models at the edge, so like CUDA, TensorRT, et cetera, et cetera. Um, NVIDIA's made multiple generations of these over time um, and multiple different form factors. Um, what I have shown right here is the Orin uh, AGX dev kit. Uh, by the way, I have one of those with me. If anyone's like really interested to see this stuff in action, come, uh, come talk to me and maybe you can show it off. And then there's a whole sort of ecosystem of um, third-party carrier boards. So um, NVIDIA sells these little modules and you slot them into these carrier boards and that's what you just to ship on your product, or you can build your own custom carry reward if you want to as well. But anyway, just to say that there's a whole bunch of different combinations about how you can, um, different device types, I said the different form factors and the different generations, and NVIDIA changes stuff all the time under the hood, so it's good to be able to test across all the different variants of the Jetson platforms that we want to support. Uh, NVIDIA um, releases this board support package they call Jetpack or Linux from Tegra. Um, slightly different, slight difference between the two of them, but it's an Ubuntu-based system that gives you a lot of devs that you have to un unpack and handle in various ways. So for, for some of the components, the source is available. Some of them are closed proprietary stuff. Um, what I, a project that I made and released last year is what I call Jetpack Nix OS, and this takes the uh, NVIDIA's Jetpack um, and takes, unpacks all the stuff. Uh, I have NixOS modules to like load up the right kernel, the right kernel drivers, various services that are required for Jetson devices, et cetera, just to get to the point where you, know, you just have like set three options to say, okay, turn it on, what's the type of device I'm running, what carrier board am I running on? And uh, the goal is like, I had all the gory details, you don't have to deal with NVIDIA stuff. Um, as part of that, um, we have stuff like uh, platform flashing scripts. Don't, don't even look at NVIDIA's flashing scripts. If you think bash scripts are bad, it's a horror. It's, uh, it's absolutely miserable. Uh, they have a vendor, a 5.10 based vendor kernel uh, that they have a bunch of patches on top of. Um, as well as they also provide the source for some of the lower level um, bootloader components. So EDK2 based UEFI firmware, if you know what that is. And uh, they provide the source and patches for ARM trusted firmware. Opti based, based things as well. And then a bunch of different packages for the GPU computing stuff I talked about, multimedia libraries for hardware accelerated, accelerated uh, video stuff, uh, graphics and power slash fan control. So that's the, that's the target that I'm gonna discuss in this, this talk. But uh, getting back to the sort of the machine testing aspect of this is okay, the goal is to run arbitrary NixOS configurations on physical machines and assert various things. Um, and I just kind of made a list of like the features that I want in this sort of system. So first of all, statelessness. Um, you know, we're all Nix people, so we, we appreciate how, how tricky state can be to handle properly. Um, it's even more so on physical devices where you can't just garbage collect it, throw away and get a new one. You, you want to make sure that you're not having state from one test affect the next test that you run. Uh, I also want it to be fast as well, like the feature I get from the you get from the NixOS VM tests is because they bind mount the Nix store relatively quick to just make a change to your test and rerun it. Um, I also want to be pretty flexible. Like I said, ARM, ARM, uh, ARM boards are, are so different. They're special snowflakes. So you need to have some ability to like um, change how you might boot a, boot a board or how you might interact with them. And then also scalability is like we'd like to be able to have you know, big racks full of dozens to hundreds to multiple hundreds maybe um, at some point. So the, tech, the way the architecture has turned out for what we've built is we have a rack, physical rack, that I'll show in a picture coming up. It has a centralized sort of test server at the bottom, um, and it has an internal, um, uh, internal LAN um, with a VLAN-enabled switch. 
Um, and then on a, we have a whole bunch of trays, and on each tray are these pairs of device controllers and devices. Um, and the controller has some connections to the device to be able to um, interact with various interfaces. So for in the easiest version of that, here's, here's our very early pr proof of concept that I made. So on the left-hand side is the device under test, which is a Xavier AGX just flipped upside down. And on the right-hand side is a Raspberry Pi. Specifically, it's a Pi KVM, which is cool for other reasons. We can talk about that later. Um, and in the middle, I have a breadboard with a few solid-state relays on it. And what I can do with that is I have connections back to the board, and they have these little automation headers where you can, if you connect certain pins, you can reset the device, you can put it into recovery mode, um, you can press the power button, et cetera, et cetera. And then, so the breadboard is just, we can access that from the Raspberry Pi by activating certain GPIO, GPIO pins, setting them high or low. And that enables us to at least um, control the, the if you, when we want to reset, we want to put in recovery mode. Additionally, a few other cables connected to the device on the left-hand side. Um, it's connected via USB-C. Um, we use that to flash the um, firmware for the device. You put it in recovery mode, you run NVIDIA script, writes new firmware. There's a mini, piece, mini USB on the other, micro USB as well, which you get the serial console over. And then at the top we have this device called an SD Mux, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well, but allows us to virtual, sort of like virtualize the SD card. Um, and actually, here's a picture of it. Like I said, the, so there's like, be, between the device under test and the controller, there's a whole bunch of interfaces we might want to be able to do things with. Uh, serial, reset recovery, SD card. This is a really cool device um, made by the Samsung Tizen people. You can buy them online from 3MDEB uh, store, um, I think a Poland outfit. Polish outfit, and they, um, what it ends up being is you, you have a SD card on it, you plug the, S, the SD side of it, it looks like the SD card, into the device under test, and on the other side, you plug in via USB, and then they have some software that allows you to switch electrically, is the SD card connected to the device under test, or is it exposed to the host machine as a USB mass storage device? So then you can, one thing you could do would be to um, put it to the host, write out like an ISO or a disk image of some kind, switch it back to the device, reset the device, and then it should boot up off the SD card. Um, you can also do stuff like, like that with you know, USB OTG emulated devices, so like gadget FS type things. So mouse and keyboard we can emulate, um, USB mass storage, you could run Ethernet over that as well. So a whole bunch of like options about types of things you can do to interact with the device. A typical test, test life cycle for these NVIDIA Jetson boards is the controller like presses that reset pin using that relay, um, and then we have the device netboot. So this is part of like the statelessness that I wanted, right? I was just like, I don't want to have to actually write out stuff to the disk if I don't, if I don't have to. So it can do UEFI netboot into iPixie. iPixie can then load the kernel and the initRD associated with the actual like Nixos system we want to run on the device. Um, once that loads up, at the end of stage one, we have the NIC store, we mount that via NFS over the network. So the NIC store on the server at the bottom is the thing that's actually like it's shared, it's NIC store is shared across all the devices under test. So you just have to copy closure your thing to the one device and it's accessible on the device you're booting into. So at that point it can continue to boot all the way up to the login prompt and we can have the controller wait for the, uh, watch the serial console wait for the login prompt and then ultimately run whatever device test you specifically want to run. Um, uh, here are some of the tests we built for Jetson devices, like flashing firmware, just really basic boot tests, can it boot up at all? Are there like fatal D message errors happening or not? Uh, we have some tests to run NVIDIA's sample programs to exercise NVIDIA's specific functionality, CUDA, TensorRT, et cetera. And so really tricky ones around like firmware UEFI capsule updates. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it, but it's cool. You can do secure boot stuff with on Fuse devices. You can ensure that the Jetson device only loads firmware that has been signed by a private key that you, the, a public, uh, signed by a private key whose public key is fused into the Jetson itself. So it's like extending secure boot all the way back to the, you know, the reset vector. Uh, I said we put these things into racks 
physical racks. So here's another er relatively earlier example of what we've done. Here you can see at the bottom we have, on the left-hand side is the device controller. On the right-hand side, that's another Jetson device, the smaller variant called the Or Nano. Um, and we're starting to scale, okay, we're a little bit further in history now of this, and we're starting to scale up into having, you know, putting more and more devices into each tray and having additional trays. Um, we can do some clever things about making it a little nicer, about um, maybe centralizing the power distribution across this board um, so we can have multiple devices. Um, and then here we are, is like, this is relatively recent in terms of where we are, but we have, uh, at this point, five racks mostly filled. Um, but I, at this point, you know, we're at, we're at a place where we feel like we can continue to expand the set of devices we have under test. Um, um, I just want to talk about the sort of need for flexibility. I described the, um, you know, that life cycle of a test for the Jetson device. As I said, ARM devices are kind of like each one's a little bit unique. And depending on what exactly you're trying to test, you might need to do something different. So, you know, you might need a device controller with relays there to physically press the reset button. Or maybe you can do like IPMI or something if you have an x86 server. Um, um, how do you load the platform firmware initially? Like, um, you could rely on whatever is currently on there. That's kind of like, then you have state left over on the device. If you want to be real um, complete, you would, you know, reflash it every time. But there are some problems with, like, uh, flash memory life cycles um, there. Um, IMX8 boards can load up firmware over USB in recovery mode. Cool stuff that you can do there. You could also, like, put the platform firmware on the SD card. Um, put your U-boot there, all that sort of stuff. And then, like, how to, okay, with variations on how to load the kernel in the NITRD, you can, like, net boot it, like I said. We could also just put the kernel in the NITRD onto the SD card that we, like, temporarily write out. That's still pretty quick because it's only the kernel in the NITRD we're putting there. Everything else we can load up via NFS over the, the local network. And you can do something similar with, like, USB emulated mass storage device. Um, I mentioned we, you know, we mount the next door via NFS. We could also mount a full system from the SD card or the, the USB mass storage device if you want to test something that's a little bit more representative of what you might actually ship. Um, well, hopefully not on SD cards, but... Um, and then the variations on how exactly you view the console. Um, maybe someday we'll be real clever or do, like, video capture and OCR and stuff for the really, really tricky ones, but hopefully you have the serial port that you can just watch and see your D-message outputs. Kind of just to wrap up, this is, like I said, this is kind of the direction I'd love to see this stuff go. Um, what we have built, what I have built, is uh, largely a bunch of, like, NIC bash scripts that are composed via NICs. Um, the world that I'd like to get to is to somewhat integrate this um, with the existing NixOS test framework. So the existing NixOS test framework is pretty specific to QEMU currently. However, if you look at the implementation of this, like, Python machine class, there's a bunch of things that you would like probably, like, you, maybe we can write in, an alternative implementation of the machine class that instead of interacting with QMU, it just does the interaction with the device controller or the, the NFS server or what have you. Um, and then we could, you know, just swap out which implementation of the machine class we're using and have a very similar interface between NixOS VM tests and physical tests. And there's some, um, this has been some talk um, on the GitHub about Modu somewhat modularized in the test framework to support use cases beyond just QEMU. The one most people have talked about in the past has been container-based systems, but I think it's also worth considering potentially physical machines, and um, like I said, because these machines are so, um, so specific to the particular vendor and hardware, I think it's, we need to add a lot of the hooks in the right places to allow users to uh, specify exactly how they want to do a lot of these things, like how they get serial, how they reset the device, et cetera, et cetera. But that's, uh, that's my talk. I'm very happy to, to be here. Hope you enjoyed it. All right. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, if you're the next speaker, um, come show up. <laughs> I don't know where they are yet. Uh, so uh, first question in the back over here. Thank you for the uh, interesting talk. Um, 
So you, in the end, you mentioned QEMU-based uh, testing. Do you know if there are any efforts into um, making software-based replicas of such ARM systems? So you could try to virtualize different manufacturers and then... Oh, um, yes, yeah, so some vendors do have some of that stuff where you can directly use like QEMU-specific drivers, like I think Xilinx boards have some of the stuff where you can just emulate Xilinx specific functionality on it. But um, not every vendor has stuff, stuff like that. Um, I'm not an expert. I wouldn't be able to implement that stuff in QEMU. I don't, and I don't know the low level details of any of the NVIDIA Jetson platforms that they have. You know, NVIDIA keeps all that stuff secret. Um, so we kind of have to work on physical devices. But certainly there are some, like, um, like, like I said on Xilinx ARM boards, you can, you can do some interesting stuff with the drivers that are in QEMU. Okay, yeah, thank you. Cool. All right, next question. Making my way, making my way. So what's the cool thing with the Raspberry Pi KVM? Oh, right, uh, let me return to that. Um, I think the, if, you're, if you wanted to do something like this, I think a good place to start is the, Raspberry, the Pi KVM. So the Pi KVM, they have their own software to like act like a KVM. But as part of that, they have their own little thing where they um, do the GPIO and the solid state relays and you can plug it into your, like, your desktop computer in the pins where you would normally plug in the power button and the reset button on your ATX like, chassis. Um, so it, it has a lot of the hardware, it can control a lot of that stuff. It even has like, you know, HDMI capture. Um, it has a lot of great stuff. Um, unfortunately for the stuff that we were doing, we, ended, we quickly like, ran out of, we couldn't use exactly what the Pi KVM stuff we did, so we had to like, basically make our own version of it. All right, we have time for one more question. So NixOS tests run inside a derivation over here, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, which obviously isn't possible with the real yes. hardware. So where does this run? Is it like a CI pipeline or is it some other system? Um, so there, like I said, there's the test server at the bottom of the rack that like, coordinates the overall test, like contacts the device controller and it runs the test. But it's on a local network. Um, so the test server has two connections. It has one connection to the external inter ethernet, internet or whatever, and one connection that goes to the, uh, the internal switch. And so hopefully, like, you know, we, we, you're right, we can't, do, we can't run it in a sandbox because it's, you know, it's real physical assets. But we can do some stuff to like, prevent people from reaching out to random network services and grabbing like, really impure data. Um, hope that helps. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Let's give him a round of applause.